Welcome viewers to the eighth and final academic session of our action-oriented global tipping point summit. We're delighted to see participants from various parts of India and from other countries as well. Neuroeducation is a new area for most of us. Please do participate actively by typing your questions in the chat box. This summit has been conceptualized by the dynamic education futurist, TEDx speaker, internationally acclaimed educator and storyteller, Dr. Pumi S. Vivaina. In October 2016, Dr. Vivaina retired as professor and head of the Department of English, University of Mumbai, India. Dr. Vivaina has two PhD degrees to her credit, one in literature and the other in education. She has published 11 books and 58 papers in peer-reviewed national and international journals and critical anthologies. She has won numerous national and international awards. In 2013, her book on education, Sourceful Intelligence, was selected as among the 18 best books in the U.S. And her most recent book, What Children Really Want, has received critical acclaim from educators, psychologists, parents, writers from all over the world. In 2015, she was selected by the world leaders in education as among the 35 women from across the world changing educational paradigms. Dr. Vivaina has her own storytelling association called Wordfully Yours, which hosts storytelling programs and conducts training workshops. I now invite Dr. Vivaina to say a few words, after which we will show you a short film on the subject. Over to you, Dr. Vivaina. Thank you very much, Anina, and a warm welcome to everyone to the final session of the Education Summit. This has been a great journey for all of us. Those of you who have been attending all the sessions will agree with me that we've had fantastic speakers giving us real world insights and a lot of takeaways from this particular session, from this particular summit. A very, very very, very warm welcome to everyone. And thank you to all the speakers, the change facilitators, and the 108 people who've been working tirelessly towards this summit. A very special thank you to our advisory board comprising Dr. Firoza Godrej, Mr. Noshir Kurodi, Mr. Noshir Dadravala, Mr. Sanjay Rastogi, Dr. Shena Skama, Mr. Yazdi Tantra, Ms. Debika Chatterjee, Ms. Raki Chabria, and Ms. Fiona Reynolds. A big thank you to Ms. Donna Reen, who has been working tirelessly with me for over 18 months on this summit. Thank you, Donna. This couldn't have happened without your help and the help of the core committee. Again, comprising Mr. Yasti Tantra, Ms. Deepa Soman, Mr. Milin Soman, Mr. Glenn Concesio, Mr. Bhavan Shah. Our partners for the summit are Tata Trent, Tantra Tech, K Merck, Lumiere Business Solutions, Education World, Parents World, Penn Ultimate, Teachers Help Teachers, First Moms Club, and Wolves. The short film that you saw at the beginning of the program has been made by Wolves. We have been extremely fortunate to have received support from luminaries like the Dalai Lama. His Holiness sent us a letter just one night before the summit began. The first paragraph of the summit says, I'm pleased to know about the Global Tipping Point Summit and its focus on improving the present educational system so that our younger generation can become more responsible citizens of our planet. We have also received congratulatory messages from Lieutenant General Shokin Chauhan, recipient of five Presidential Distinguished Service Awards, Dr. Kersi Chowda, one of the leading psychiatrists of India, Shri M, uh, a spiritual guide, social reformer, educationist, and Padma Bhushan awardee, Mr. Shamak Dava, internationally acclaimed choreographer, dancer, singer, performer, and entertainment director. Cyrus Brocha, TV anchor, theater personality, comedian, political satirist, podcaster, and author. And Mr. Bama Nirani, 
Indian theater and Bollywood actor, voice artist and photographer. We also owe thanks to our design team, organizing team and technical team. The design team comprising Rhea Soman, Disha Upreti, Janavi Kulkarni and Rohan Sindhika. Our organizing team comprising Sharuk Vevaina, Dr. Nina Nair, Shalanta Mascarinas, Valerie Mendonsa, Mustak Sheikh, Madhu Nair, Gautami Ambe, and Dipti Mazumdar. And our technical team, Pezan Charna, Ashish Kadam, Disha Poddar, and Neha Vatsala. A very, very a, 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 a thank you from all of us. We also thank our partner institutions, Vidyachal School Vikroli, JB Pettit School for Girls Fort, St. Michael's Academy Adyar Chennai, Zoram Education Mizoram, uh, Sership Trust Mizoram, JBCN International School Burivli, Activity High School Mumbai, Vidyashram International School Jodhpur Rajasthan, Vidyo High School Iroli Mumbai, Tomag Education, Tata Trust, Vidyo High, Bangalore, Hansraj uh, College of Education, Kar, Mumbai, St. Andrews College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Bandra, DSB International School, Mumbai. We owe a special thanks to the Patak Group of Education, Mumbai, for being our partner institution and experimental school for action groups and eight schools of the Aga Khan Education Service India for partnering with us. We have had excellent speakers and extremely exciting projects. Satya Raghavan's project is now open for uh, Google Forms for people to sign up as action group members, spreading awareness of basic rights and equality through the digital medium, Manit Jain, leveraging interdisciplinary modeling experience, Nitin Orion creating sustainable livelihood solutions for rural educated youth. My session on empowering stories with technopoesis for Earth Love Mission. Fiona Reynolds developing you and using self awareness in educational leaders. Mahira Goyal creating social emotional learning SEL in teacher communities. We also have projects which. Uh, uh, the project that was declared yesterday by Dr. Rakesh Godwani, Actionable Strategies for Need-Based Education. And we're all looking forward to a brand new area in education, which Dr. Mazda Turel is today going to introduce us to, neuroeducation. Uh, the project is a nodding acquaintance with the development of a child's brain. Google Forms are available on our website uh, www.gtpsforchange.org. Please sign up and become members of our action group. The last date for signing up for action groups will be Sunday, 20th December, 2020. So with that, I invite you to the next summit. The next vertical that we have is parenting. However, this summit is not merely for parents. It's for all who engage with young people. At the inauguration, we have Dr. Sujata Sriram and R. Sridhar. The first academic session will be conducted by Father Joe Pereira on the changing face of addiction in, uh, in and post pandemic. Bittu Saigal, very, very well known to all nature lovers, will be talking on mindfully and heartfully connecting children to the earth. Suzanne Rodericks from the UAE will be conducting a session on nurturing creativity with the arts. Varsha Makija, it takes a village to raise a differently able child. We also have Mr. Jim Lim Tech Wee from Singapore talking on cyber wellness, the power of human relationships in cyberspace. Sraddalu Ranade from the Aurobindo Ashram talking about integral parenting. Our special guest speaker, Father Godfrey Disa, talking about handling depression in the post COVID situation. Mahera Desai, the scars of shaming. 
Dr. Mark McLeod from Australia on the awareness and involvement of teaching in social justice issues. And like Mr. Milan Soman today, Deepa Soman will point the way forward. So as you see, the themes are relevant to all who engage with young people. Come and join this summit. We want educators and parents to be on the same page. So we do hope to see you at the Parenting Summit from Friday, 8th January, 2021 to Sunday, 31st January, 2021 on weekends only. Thank you very much. And over to you, um, Glenn. The online Global Tipping Point Summit from November this year to January 2021 is designed to explore paradigm shifts in education and parenting in an innovative way. Our aim is to create healthy learning and nurturing ecosystems by combining knowledge with self-awareness and wisdom to transform our lack-based consciousness into one rooted in abundance. Who will be attending the summit? Policymakers and education board authorities, principals, teachers, college and university professors, parents, caregivers, librarians, counselors, students, and anyone who's interested in education and parenting. What do we do differently? We have world-class visionaries and thought leaders as speakers who will expound their ideas and point the way in the right direction. They will be supported by far in the belly change facilitators who will suggest effective and practical ways of implementing the ideas of the speakers. At the online summit, participants will be invited to form action groups in the areas of their choice and to create the change they wish to see in the world. By 2025, we hope to reach out to as many people as possible through face-to-face -face and online talks and workshops. Come, be a part of the change. For more details on the summit, please visit our website www.gtps4change.org. See you there. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Glenn. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Masda Turel. Dr. Turel completed his degree in medicine from Grant Medical College and Sir J.J. Group of Hospital in Mumbai and went on to pursue an MCH degree in neurosurgery from the prestigious Christian Medical College in Bellor, India. He was awarded the Jacob Chandi Gold Medal at his graduation a distinction that has only been conferred previously on four other recipients since its institution 35 years ago. His prolific clinical research has garnered several academic accolades, both nationally and internationally, and has resulted in over 100 publications in esteemed scientific journals and textbooks. After completing his residency, he visited several departments of neurosurgery across the world and earned a diploma in minimally invasive neurosurgery from Beijing, China. He then went on to complete a fellowship in skull-based surgery and neuro-oncology at the illustrious Toronto Western Hospital and another fellowship in minimally invasive and complex spine surgery at the Rush University in Chicago, after which he crossed continents to travel to Shanghai to specialize in cerebrovascular surgery with an emphasis on arterial bypasses in the brain. He is currently practicing as a neurosurgeon at the prestigious Vocard Hospitals, South Mumbai, as well as assistant honorary professor at his alma mater, 
Grant Medical College and Sir J.J. Cooper Hospitals. Dr. Turell is a general practice neurosurgeon who specializes in the treatment of diseases of the brain and spine and advocates an approach to neurosurgery that is both balanced and aggressive. His practice style is collaborative and he strongly believes that incorporation of patients, their families and the medical staff as members of his team offers patients the best possible outcome and satisfaction. In addition to all this, he is a professional columnist for the Jame Jamshed newspaper, as well as the Sunday Midday, in which he writes a fortnightly column on neurosurgical anecdotes, enlightening the common man and demystifying the enigma of the human brain and spine. A very warm welcome once again to you, Dr. Basla Turel, and over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, from from that uh, kind introduction, it's very clear that I know very little about uh, neuroeducation, and uh, all my focus is on uh, neurosurgery. But let us uh, actually delve into what neuroscience teaches us about the brain. Usually, whenever I uh, give a talk. Uh, I have a background uh, that has uh, photo frames of my children in it, but since this is an education summit, I switched my table across this time and uh, uh, have some books in the background just to seem a little uh, more intellectual. But uh, don't be fooled by what you see behind, okay? What we have learned about the brain in the last five years is much more than what we have learned about it in the last say 100 years. What we will learn about it in the next one year is much more than what we have learned about it in the last five years. So it's literally a gold mine that we are sitting on. Actually, the gold mine is sitting on us. You can see that the human brain is just a, is just a, three pound mass of jelly uh, that fits in the palm of your hand and it can, it can contemplate the vastness of interstellar space. It can contemplate the concept of infinity. It can contemplate itself contemplating. It asks questions like, who am I? Uh, what is the purpose of life and death? What am I doing here on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock when I could be snoozing peacefully? We in neuroscience have a very elitist view about our subject. We believe that the chief function of the rest of the body is just to carry the brain around. And at the center of this belief is the neuron, this single cell that consists of dendrites and axons. And all of these interconnect with each other. And there are 100 billion neurons that probably form more than a trillion synapses. And these interact with each, uh, each other. And this interaction is, is what forms the basis of, of human nature and human consciousness. You can see that there are about 100 billion neurons. And the weight of the brain is only about 1,500 grams. Even if you have a big ego, even if you're pig headed, doesn't really alter that much, but it occupies or it uses one fourth of the energy of the body. And the reason it does that is that it, it's, it's a, it's a fireboard of circuitry. It generates crazy amount of uh, electrical impulses. And these impulses can be, they can be uh, measured now very, very accurately. And you, it's because you need to reshare your screen, please. It's not sharing. No. Right from the beginning. Yes. Uh, oh, you. Uh, oh my God. Can you see see it now? Yes. 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 So you didn't see anything before. No. 
Okay, you didn't miss much. Just some pretty images. Um, so here we are. Just a couple of exotic images of the brain, nothing else. But um, you can hear me and see me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. So while we talk of the brain as the, the cerebrum, we've now realized that an equal number of neurons that are present in the cerebrum are present in the cerebellum or the hindbrain. And initially, this part of the brain was thought to be concerned with posture, balance, equilibrium. But now it has an explicit role in memory, cognition, and even its connections with consciousness. And as we grow old, um, the way the brain develops is through myelination. Uh, myelin is the protein that actually lines axons of the brain and it acts like an insulation wire to allow for the conduction of these impulses that we spoke about. And it's the reason why a child's brain increases. And this is why maximum development of the human brain takes place before the age of four. And I realized this fact only two weeks before my daughter's fourth birthday. And I tried everything possible. You know, I read to her every single day, did some music, art. Some of it worked, but I think we should have started earlier. No two brains, no two brains are the same. Like our fingerprints, like the shape of our, of our ear lobe, like the pattern of our iris. Every single brain, even though it looks pretty similar, uh, is enigmatic in its own way. And so students are different, teachers are different, educators are different. They all come with uh, uh, different backgrounds. They're all living different breathing organisms that, uh, that have millions of years of evolutionary history that is incorporated into their DNA. So it's extremely important that this summit is taken very seriously because this model of one size fits all will not work for education. You see, the brain has evolved so much. This is what the human brain looks like now, and we are still constantly evolving. Uh, researchers and scientists tell us that in a couple of years from now, a couple of many, many years from now, we'll have bigger heads than what we do. We'll have bigger eyeballs because of the information overload that we are sustaining. And uh, it's, it's evolution is taking place at a really fast pace. This is what the cerebral cortex looks like when you look at it superficially. This is just about six to seven millimeters thick. And when you look at it under the illumination of the microscope, this is how beautifully magnificent it looks. And, and just these six to seven millimeters of, of cortex is what is, is actually what makes us human. This is what brings to us our nature. This is what tells people who we really are. And then there is this immense connection of white matter fibers that you can see that interconnect with one another. And now we can study these fibers very, very um, efficiently. Uh, and all these fibers, once that were thought were not important, suddenly we've been able to uh, give form and function to them. And they're able to recognize what their role was, which we once upon a time thought uh, to be redundant in some sense. Now, when we look at the brain, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Broca who actually identified 44 distinct areas of the brain responsible for function. And when we look at language, and I'm talking about language because it's a key area of development in a child's brain, there are two main areas, the Broca's area, which is responsible for fluency, and the Wernicke's area, which is responsible for comprehension. And they are connected through a band of white matter, which is responsible for repetition. And language, besides these three modalities, also has naming, reading, and writing, which are located fairly close by and interconnected with one another. But the human brain is fairly flexible. Like we don't have one particular spot for the speech production of language. And consider one of these red, dot, red dots as a separate patient. And when we map patients awake during surgery and when we stimulate the cortex, we can elicit a speech arrest in and around the language area. So it's not one fixed spot that we thought it was once upon a time. And similarly, the purple dots are areas of comprehension. So someone can be comprehending over here, whereas someone's comprehension center may be four centimeters behind. And this is what allows us to actually operate on the brain in where patients have pathologies within these eloquent areas without damaging these areas. 
So this is a patient who has a brain tumor. This black spot is a brain tumor, which is presumed to be in the Broca's area or the speech producing area of the brain. And when we do a functional MRI, we put a patient in the MRI machine and ask him to generate verbs. And this yellow area lights up. When this yellow area lights up, we know that that is the speech area. And when we know, we can identify that this tumor, which we thought on an anatomical basis is smack in the Broca's area, is not in the Broca's area, but the Broca's area is pushed down by tumor. So we can actually go into the operating room, operate on these patients awake and remove these tumors very successfully. This is another lady who had a large tumor in the left temporal area, as you can see. On an MRI, left and right is always switched. So what looks to be your right is actually the left. You can see this tumor. This lady was fluent in speaking Marathi. And she had a seizure. And this tumor was diagnosed. And she instantly switched her speaking to Hindi. Her husband said she's never spoken a word of Hindi in her life. Cases like this enable us to understand the flexibility of the human brain, the malleability of the human brain. We removed this tumor completely while she was awake, mapping her uh, speech functions. And three to six months later, she regained her native Marathi and completely stopped speaking in Hindi. So there is this concept that a lot of the human brain is in some sense redundant. We can remove chunks of the frontal lobe. We can remove chunks of the temporal lobe without uh, seemingly causing any significant uh, neurological damage. But on finer and minute testing, we are finding that no area of the brain actually can be regarded as non-eloquent. Every area of the brain has to be considered as eloquent. There are theories that say scientists tell us that we are only using about 5 to 10% of our brain. And we've all had special encounters with people who use much less than that. But uh, this is what is new that we are learning. Again, Phantom limbs. This is a way in which neuroscience is able to trick the brain. Is a patient who has an amputated limb, feels severe pain, feels tingling sensations, feels cramps, but using a mirror box, using a mirror box, the mirror image of the normal body part helps us reorganize and integrate the mismatch between proprioception and visual feedback of the removed body. And uh, patients have a significant alleviation of their pain with this mechanism. And now we are using this for strokes. We are using this for uh, several other pathologies. Even the motor area of the brain in some sense is, is, is malleable. We can now operate on the, the brain as such doesn't feel any pain. So we can operate on, a, on, on areas on patients who have tumors in the motor area with the patient being completely awake by testing their hand function, leg function, while we are removing these tumors from their head. And all this while the patient is actually watching this operation on a screen right in front of them. So this is something that we've been doing only for the last two decades now. Uh, once upon a time, it was thought impossible to do uh, things like this. So neuroscience is constantly evolving and is constantly teaching us stuff that we didn't know. Epilepsy is another area where the brain gets reorganized completely. And this concept of neuroplasticity comes and you can see that this patient had 40 seizures a day, 40 seizures a day, and he's got some involvement of the left hemisphere. His diagnosis was that of a condition called Rasmussen's encephalitis. And we've disconnected the entire left hemisphere from the right hemisphere. So we've cut off everything that connects the left half of the brain to the right half. And by that means, this patient should be completely hemiplegic, should have no language function. But you, you can see him one year later, absolutely uh, riding a bicycle with alarming fluency and has switched to writing with his left hand and is able to uh, perform very well in school. So we've been brainwashed to think that uh, neurogenesis doesn't take place, that the neurons don't regenerate, but all of this is happening and we have now scientific evidence to prove that this is happening. Again, this major concept of right and left brain, while the right brain is considered more visuospatial and creative and the left brain is considered a logical one, this Theory is also being defunct, and it's more to do with the networks that connect the two hemispheres rather than you've seen this uh, photo. And if you're right brained, you'll see this image as uh, pink and white. If you're left brained, you'll see this image as green and gray. And if this was a live audience, one group would completely disagree that the other possibility exists. But it'll be interesting to see what your uh, ideas are. Also, 
this color may change for you depending on what task you're performing. So we are learning more and more about neuroscience, teaching us things that increase our creativity, increase our emotional intelligence. And like mu muscles build with exercise, uh, the brain muscle is actually built with something called as inner size. There is this uh, age old dilemma. Are there any physical differences between the female brain and the male brain? And after deep research, this is all uh, I could find. We've been able to map the female brain pretty successfully. And uh, you might accuse me of uh, neurosexism, but uh, more or less, uh, most of the members of the audience would agree with me. Well, the male brain is not uh, that complicated. Uh, it's pretty easy to uh, decipher and uh, we are by and large a fairly uh, simple sex with very basic uh, requirements. I'm going to spend 30 seconds so you can uh, go through it and, and wake up if you've already fallen asleep. But the human brain is constantly changing and constantly evolving in its chemical form, in its structural form, in its functional form. And now we have the ability to bring about these changes right from infancy to adulthood. Uh, for example, a practice of mindfulness or meditation. Once upon a time, people said, show us the benefits of meditation. Uh, now neuroscience is able to show that there is an increase in the cortical thickness in certain areas of the brain, such as the insula, such as the prefrontal cortex. And when it's compared to people who are not meditating, these structural effects are seen on the brain, functional effects are seen on the brain. Imagine these to be just two Martian syllables, uh, random words such as uh, random uh, alphabets such as Kiki and Booba. Uh, take two seconds in your head and name the one you feel is Kiki and name the one you feel is Booba. I bet you 90% of you will say that the image on the left, which is the one with the pointed inflictions is Kiki and the image on the right is Booba. And that's how we've trained our brain to think, uh, looking at this image, our auditory, uh, when we say the sound Kiki, the auditory hair cells in the ear correspond with the temporal lobe and make a mental image. And uh, we are able to say that this is Kiki and this is Booba. But I asked my daughters the same question. And uh, both of them said the converse. So their brain is developing in a different fashion. Their brain is still very, very malleable. Their brain is still very uh, uh, subject to being uh, formed with the infinite potentials and possibilities that are available in uh, our today's day and age. Neurogenesis, once we thought, once upon a time, we thought that new neurons are not possible to be formed. But now we know that while majority of the neurons are formed in the fetus, some point in time, there are certain areas of the body, of the brain, that allow for neurogenesis to take place. And more so, this happens in the limbic system, the emotional system of the brain, which is responsible for flight or fight, which is responsible for emotional memories. And these communicate with the, the, the human brain, the, the reptilian brain or the basic instincts communicate with more evolved instincts. And there is always this constant uh, attempt to make a union between emotional and intellect uh, for us to be able to uh, uh, live effectively. Uh, you have to understand that any change that happens at a physical or a physiological level has a corresponding emotional uh, equi equivalent to it. And we are able to now prove this with the help of neuroscience and vice versa. And we also have simple, fairly simple uh, ways in which uh, we can bring about this evolution in our own brains. Very, very basic stuff. Movement is another thing that is of extreme essence and extreme importance, and especially in children. There's really no way to quantify when a child spends one hour uh, in the playground or in the swimming pool or playing football, what impact it has on his brain, as opposed to him completing uh, sheets and sheets of homework, which can be physically demonstrated. We constantly tell our children, stop jumping. That's the only advice uh, we, we, we give our kids. But actually, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's the thing that they should be doing all their childhood. 
because uh, the frontal cortex processes uh, planned movement. Jumping increases uh, BDNF, which is brain-derived neurotrophic fracture, which is which uh, uh, is an extremely important uh, nutrient of myelin. It increases the quality of white matter, and it does a host of other things. Even as you grow older, the only advice that people who've lived up to a hundred uh, will tell you is keep moving. You don't have to do vigorous exercise. You don't have to do uh, anything fancy. Just keep moving. The other thing is. Really, the neuroscience of storytelling, which we are trying to bring about as an action project in our theme, I means stories inspire us. They tell us, uh, they fill us with awe. They give us uh, insights into people's lives. They they are such a important part of our social fabric. They're important for survival. They allow us to talk to one another. And listening to stories, hearing stories, writing stories. elicits certain amount of hormones in the body which teach us empathy which teach us how to deal with stress they help us connect uh, the two sides of the brain which is what uh, eventually is everything is about the left brain talking to the uh, right side of the brain and uh, story is actually in some sense are a moral are, are a moral compass uh, for the way we live and it's extremely important that we inculcate uh, storytelling as a as a paradigm uh in this particular age group in children and you have to study child development in a very systematic manner and see what works for what uh, age age group for example this particular age group where storytelling is extremely effective at the same time they are not able to think very logically so if you tell them teach them things like sharing teach them things like don't be so materialistic they really don't get this concept so trying to uh, bark uh, 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 around the wrong tree is not uh, the the best way to actually implement neuroscience in uh, neuroeducation but while it's extremely important what stories we tell our children as adults the more important question is what stories are we telling ourselves as humanity the stories we believe about ourselves determine how we treat one another as long as we believe in the idea that we are not all part of the same human family but only part of a certain group will we act accordingly the more we can understand and believe in our interconnectedness our mutual independent interdependence the more we will treat ourselves and one another with a greater sense of uh, compassion it's always striving for this fine balance between the heart and the brain and because i'm into neuroscience my uh scale is tipped more in favor of the brain but music i mean i know we've covered music uh in a previous session but music has an extremely important uh role in cognition and an, it, it forms the very basis of our existence in some sense and uh various forms and various formats of school are incorporating different ways in which music can be incorporated into their uh, uh, uh into their uh, curriculum but details of those also need to be uh, studied i mean we all know of this uh, famous mozart effect but uh, in the indian scenario probably even uh, bappi lehri and anu malik can do it for uh, some people we have studied uh, functional mris of uh, people with uh, who are musically inclined and who are creative and the music areas of the brain primarily the temporal lobes are large in this uh, my father had operated on the famous uh, ghazal singer jagjit singh and when he had a stroke and, and a brain hemorrhage and he told me that uh, his temporal lobes were really really large uh, compared to what he seen in uh, normal uh, people who are non musicians we can even take people into the uh, operation room and this patient not mine but had a particular spasm of his uh fingers only while playing one particular note on the guitar and with the facility of deep brain stimulation we can stimulate the area of the brain responsible for that abnormality and get him back to doing whatever he does normally and similarly art uh once upon a time art was just you know drawing with crayons and uh, and craft etc but art has moved to such a transcendental level now that it affects the physical social sensory and cognitive aspects of a child's uh, well being and uh, in the parenting summit there is a is a special uh, talk on on the importance of art in in bringing up children and we are going to focus one of our 
action groups on on that particular aspect as well so we now have enormous amount of data uh, that allows us to bring neuroeducation into the classroom we know how we can hold children's attention we know how we can move them to using higher parts of their brain we also have begun to give importance to lower parts of the brain which uh, were considered not so very important at one point in time and we've studied development we've studied plasticity we've studied the impact of our environment on our genes and this uh, eternal uh, conflict of nature versus nurture and while we have a brain reserve while we have a cognitive reserve uh, human beings and children also have a great deal of motivational reserve and you would have heard of this famous marshmallow test where children were given one marshmallow and were told that if you wait for 15 minutes you'll get two marshmallows and 25% of those children waited 75% of those children didn't wait i also would not wait but uh, and they followed up those children in time and they found those children to have more self discipline more will power more diligence these children abstained from drugs abstained from uh, social behavior that was harmful and all these uh, uh, aspects we are now able to study and we are now able to quantify so we should be really grateful and thankful to be alive in an age of technology where there is decades of uh, neuroscience behind us and we can use these interventions now in today's day and age to not only uh, stop or to delay the cognitive uh, decline that comes from aging but also in some sense reverse it and hence in conclusion in my opinion the art of education is more important than any art in the world as we are forming souls and shaping the future of humanity and educators teachers parents are doing such a wonderful job in today's day and age that i doff my hats off to everyone especially the organizers of such a wonderful summit uh, from whom we've learned so much and with this i end my talk but this will be followed by our team of action group members who will talk about four areas that uh, we have chosen to actually study and see if these can make an objective or a subjective impact in uh, the children of today thank you very much I think our educators today will agree with me that this was an absolutely fascinating session and I'm sorry master if you felt initially that I bullied you into talking at the summit which I did but I'm so glad I did because this was really fascinating and it showed the need for collaboration we cannot now work in isolation we cannot say that at education summits we should only be calling bed med phds in education you just see how much we learned in this very fa absolutely fantastic job master and as i said i'm repeating it i'm so glad i believe you into doing this talk No, it was my pleasure. And I'm sure, and I know that the change facilitators who've been working with you over several months are feeling the same way. Even when we first talked to Masda, and I said, Masda, would you be doing this? And he said, Well, uh huh, yes, maybe. And the minute he agreed, he was the first person to jump in and say, All right, let's have meetings. What are we doing next? So there was this kind of enthusiasm and synergy, and. Uh, again i can't keep repeating but fascinating session thank you so much master thank oh, you <laughs> and with that i would like to introduce the audience to the structure of the summit those of you who have been attending all the sessions would probably know this by heart but it's really important to understand for the newcomers today that this summit is different from the usual conferences that we have at a usual conference we have a speaker we have some people asking questions and that's the end of the story but here we have the speaker at the center the speaker has guided an action project and four people whom we call the change facilitators have been working with the speaker over several months 
And each of the change facilitators have developed a module of three hours, a teaching module for three hours. Now, this module is available to anyone and everyone who's interested in this area and who wants to sign up. And this, is, this holds true of all the sessions. So if a certain speaker and the action project interests you, please sign up as action group members. What is the action group? How is it beneficial to be an action group member? You get trained by the four change facilitators. Three hour module each, four change facilitators, 12 hours of training. Then you create your own groups and you go out into the world and spread the knowledge. Try it out as a project, try and quantify it, create an impact report at the end of it. And then we hope that we will consolidate the impact reports and create a white paper for the government and tell the government that we are not merely talking about change. This is a change that we've implemented. So as, as I've said earlier, be the change to see the change has almost become a cliche, but we need to act in order to really, really bring about a transformation in education. And for that, we need to come together, neuroscientists, AI specialists, engineers, doctors, everyone needs to come together in the best interests of children. So thank you very much. I pass it now back to Nina. After that wonderful session, I'm sure our viewers are waiting to hear what the change facilitators have to say. All right, so we welcome our first change facilitator, Mr. Udayan Chakravarti. Udayan Chakravarti is a passionate yet a non-traditional educator. He began teaching on different platforms when he was a student himself, allowing him to gain the unique perspective into the psychology of students and create a friendly atmosphere where everyone is easily approachable. He has a master's degree in English and is currently pursuing a PhD. Welcome, Mr. Chakravarti, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll just take a minute to share my screen. Please let me know if this is visible. Is, is my screen visible? Can you please confirm? Yes, it is. Yeah, all right. Thank you. So I'll begin. A uh, very good evening to one and all. Uh, this action project that I will be dealing with is uh, titled as Storytelling and its impact on uh, language finesse. Many of us have uh, heard our parents, grandparents and teachers narrate stories to us in our childhood. And I'm sure that most of us enjoyed them. So we can agree that our thought processes, our characteristics, our actions and reactions are greatly influenced by the narratives we have been exposed to. As a result, neuroeducation is the future we must all look forward to. Uh, Dr. Mazda has already explained the neuroscience behind storytelling and its impact on language and other areas of the brain. I'm, however, going to reiterate a couple of sentences so that we are all on the same page. So listening to a story that's being told or read to you activates the auditory cortex of your brain. Engaging with a story also fires up your left temporal cortex. This region also happens to be receptive to language. And incidentally, this part of the brain is also capable of filtering out noise. This noise basically means overused words, cliches, or fillers. When it identifies such noise, it switches itself off. In other words, we lose our attention. As a result, skilled storytellers are careful about the language they use. They employ a host of literary techniques to keep the listener's brain engaged. This storytelling technique can be effectively used in neuroeducation as well. Uh, in stories during scenes of high action or tension, the stress hormone called cortisol is released. Moderate amounts of this hormone leads to a greater immersion and responsiveness to the arc of a story. More character-driven stories will affect the release of oxytocin into the blood, which is also known as an empathy hormone that helps people bond. Now, aren't these positive attributes, attributes that we want ourselves and our listeners to have? Uh, 
why do we specifically want storytelling to be implemented in school curriculum because there is a childhood connection to it this type of impact is especially useful in an early age i'm talking about empathy and bonding and these impacts by the time children enter the second year they have already begun to develop what's known as semantic memory semantic memory is the capacity to recall words concepts or numbers which is essential for the use of use and understanding of language however they will not be able to hold on to most of their earlier memories because they have no context on which to anchor them this changes as soon as the child begins to develop narrative skills when children begin repeating the sentences either to themselves or while re-narrating to someone else it helps them develop the context on which they can anchor their semantic memory on this has a tremendous influence on the language skills of a child uh, narrative skills also gives the child a better mechanism for making sense of the world around them it gives them a context to anchor their memories on this is something that i've already spoken about by the age of 4 or 5 a child will also have developed what's known as the theory of mind essentially this relates to their ability to put themselves in another's shoes or to be aware of their experiences here we are talking about 21st century skills like compassion empathy team spirit and so on in conclusion i can say that storytelling is sure to be an important constituent of neuroeducation the adventures and characters that children experience through stories are certain to have a lifelong impact this then is a pivotal time in their development not just in terms of vocabulary or reading skills but in the broader terms of their ability to think empathize and imagine as a part of the action group project those who sign up for the training will understand the basics of incorporating storytelling in day to day life for the purpose of instilling a wide range of social and technical skills including language skills the world of system of education primarily works on this basis and the benefit of incorporating storytelling into the curriculum or even in our day to day life will lead to the development of the much needed 21st century skills like critical reflection creative thinking change orientation that is being ready for change which is the only constant in life uh, compassion empathy team spirit and of course communication so i appeal to the audience here to sign up for this action project and together over the course of a year through this social project we'll figure out the extent to which stories have an influence in our lives thank you over to you neena thank you so much mr chakravarti we now welcome our next change facilitator ms pramila satish pramila satish has been in the field of education for over 18 years now of which she has spent around 8 years teaching in a cbse school and another 7 years teaching in a waldorf school she has been fortunate to have around 8 years leading the a level program in biology at various schools her forte is in dealing with teenagers in the age group 15 to 18 years Welcome, Ms. Satish, and over to you. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Nina, for that uh, introduction. Uh, so today, uh, the topic that I would be um, speaking a little more is the impact of art education on the cognitive development of children. Um, next slide, please. Pramila, you're not audible. Can you can you, can you raise the volume a little? You're not volu uh, audible. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Is this better? Oh yes, it's fine. So, uh, I'll be I'll be dealing with this topic of um, the impact of art education on the cognitive development of uh, children. Um, so, we are all aware of the uh, functional difference between the right and the left brain. Um, however, both these sides are tied together by a bundle of nerve fibers, which create a highway of information passing on from one side to the other. 
So whether you're performing a logical or a creative function, you're receiving input from both sides of the brain. For example, uh, if the left brain is credited with language, then the right brain helps you understand the context and tone. If the left brain handles mathematical equations, then the right brain helps you with the uh, comparisons and um, the rough estimates. Um, next slide, please. Study has also proved that 90% of a brain is developed by age five. Now, what does this mean? This means that uh, by the age five, we have almost all the nerve cells, all the neurons that we uh, need for the rest of our life. Now, what really makes the brain work is the type of connections that we form between these cells, or um, in other words, it's called synapses. So the more varied the experiences that we provide to the children, um, that would be, you know, that would help us to form different kind of brain connections, and that would help build up creativity in children. Um, these connections that are formed between the neurons um, are like how um, we take care of our uh, muscles. So the more we use these brain connections, they become more stronger, and the and the ones that we don't use, they eventually get eliminated. Next slide, please. Now, the important fact here is, um, how does art um, help children? Um, unfortunately, our education system um, caters to one side of the brain, the more the logical brain. And in this, um, the drawback is that we, 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 provide, uh, we provide a very less number of experiences to our children and hence, somewhere the creativity in them gets lost. Um, so we, we need to, we need to um, you know, engage our children in more of these activities like uh, art, visual art, music, movement, storytelling, so that we build up varied synapses in these children, which will further help develop their creativity. So a few months back, I happened to hear an um, interview by Steve Jobs. And, um, and one, one statement that struck me was uh, where he said that any new idea that is formed is nothing more than a new combination of old elements. And the ability to make these new combinations makes some people more creative. They're able to do this because they have more diverse experiences. And this is what we will be catering to when uh, we speak about uh, engaging children with more artistic activities. Um, so this action program, which I would be working on, uh, would be to develop more uh, teaching methods and strategies, which will be uh, definitely dealing with the content, but with more of artistic activities in it. So I, um, I, I welcome all those who are, um, you know, keen educators and want to bring up uh, creative um, citizens for tomorrow to please join this action program and uh, help us make this our education system the better system. Thank you. Over to Nina. We now welcome our next change facilitator, Mr. Rohan Pillay. Rohan can be best described as a passionate observer of behavior as he enjoys theorizing about the causation of natural phenomena, the master's in psychology and the bachelor's of law. Rohan teaches psychology in an international school in Kurundi, but is largely guided by a multidisciplinary approach towards knowledge. His philosophy can be summarized as, and I quote, don't worry, be happy, and keep learning. Welcome, Mr. Belair, and Hello, good evening. Uh, am I audible? Am I visible? Both. You're both. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, it's uh, amazing that, uh, uh, first and foremost, good evening all. I'm Rohan. And uh, it's amazing that when ma'am asked me, Kumi ma'am asked me, uh, that this is one idea that we have. And of course, their idea is amazing. Change facilitator. So in my mind, I was like, what are we going to change? So when they said education, I said, I'm in because it tried to change me. It didn't work. So maybe now it's my turn uh, to do something about it. And after uh, doctor's uh, uh, 
uh, initial introduction, I am in awe of what I am into. I have to get very serious very soon. So my uh, part of the training, my area is uh, basically creating neuroscience-based learning environments. So the idea is, the basic idea is that we take whatever in our, at our level, whatever we understand about neuroscience and what it talks about, how we can go and apply it to learning environments to make them a little bit more appropriate mm. towards learning and so that um, uh, students or uh, anybody who wants mm. to learn is able to grasp whatever they want to learn in a much uh, more faster, mm. lasting mm. manner. So the idea behind it is, sir, uh, if you could go to the next slide. So what we already know, what is the science, the basic science behind it is that there could, you could think about as happy chemicals. So there are certain neurotransmitters in the brain, which basically do with your affecting your mood, your arousal, your motivation. So how do we actually create environments which make it possible to stimulate the brain enough so that there are the release of neuromyelin? So there is a release of this, uh, these uh, neuro, you know, neurotransmitters and happy chemicals so that the brain is more ready to learn. Uh, let me tell you, for example, uh, certain things we easily learn because that's how evolution and our brain has created uh, us to be. For example, if I tell you, uh, being afraid of snakes. Uh, if, if I ask uh, for a show of hands, I guess most of us will be afraid, might not be at a phobia level, but at least we will keep a safe distance with anything that is slithering anywhere. We won't go and in, you know instinctively go and try to check what it is. We'll just keep it away from us. So what allows this to happen? In a way, it is the motivation to learn as quickly as possible things that threaten our survival, so evolutionary, there are certain things which we know we are motivated and geared up enough to learn quickly. So can we, can we change our learning environments to get the brain ready and motivated enough to learn the things that are important today? So basically sciences, mathematics, uh, how, do you, how do you be a good person, for example, if it is not appealing to you, uh, you will definitely not be, uh, you know, going. you're not going to go and try out being a good person also because it has to appeal to you. So can we create these type of learning environments? Uh, sir, can we go to the next slide? Right. So some of the things, what, what would we, we could call it is brain-based learning, understanding what the brain basically uh, gets motivated by and do those things, behavior. See, we can't go and really... Uh, what doctor does, uh, go and manipulate the brain physically. But what can we do? Do the corresponding behavior, manipulate the corresponding behavior in a way that then it indirectly goes and releases the chemical, chemicals which basically motivate you, keep you stimulated enough to keep learning. So you behave in a way to stimulate the brain so that the brain helps you to again behave in a way which is conducive to learning. So this is the idea. These are some of the ideas that have been placed. Keep moving around, add uh, stories, add emotion, add some personal relevance to the topic. If it's not relevant to me, I'm not going to learn it. I, I could hear this old, I could remember this old adage when you say, uh, what is the use of learning mathematics, right? Am I only going to use it for giving and taking of money or whatever? But that means you have not shown the beauty of the theory of math. So it is gone. So can you do something like this to create an environment which is uh, very stimulating no matter which subject we are teaching? Uh, so next slide, please. Yes, so I'll give you uh, an example of what I'm trying to say um, from this picture. So if I show you this picture, uh, is there any one of us who can basically at least identify 50% of these insects? I don't think so. Uh, if, if, we, if we don't, if we don't, uh, remember those years in grade eight, grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, if those who did sciences, how much time we spend behind by hearting classification of plants, classification of animals, classification of insects, for example, I would not be able to name even five of these scientific names, okay? But if I, I know a friend of mine who happens to be a very good biology teacher, and if you show him any bug, okay, he will look at that bug and he will say, this is so-and-so, scientific name is so-and-so. He will also tell you if it is male or female, he might even go as far as telling you whether that bug is depressed or not, okay? Because that's his passion. 
he is motivated to know about every nuance of whatever his biology is specification is he is that motivated if you ask me there are only two types of bug classifications one that those are which are close to you and the others which are away from you and i prefer the bugs which are classified as away from me uh, which keeps our life safer but imagine imagine if we if we could create this type of motivation at a younger age in kids for subjects like not like all subjects english mathematics history you know why this facts happened over time it's okay learning uh, dates i know history is for a lot of people without emotion what is history if you don't say that there is some learning outcome from this see this repeats itself history repeats is a, itself is something that we have kept saying but how many of us have actually felt it we know it as we go along as we get older we have this idea that life works in cycles at one time we thought grade 10 was really important but then when our children are sick then that's important then maybe there's another uh, important thing that happens and you realize that things just the 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 packaging changes but the basic emotions and requirements in life keep you know remaining the same so history repeats itself what if you create this type of insight into kids when they are learning history about india uh, world wars okay how is it important so so next i'll next slide please so the whole idea is try to enhance the learning environment the whole learning process and try to see that we focus more on a motivational quotient that is something that i made up i don't think uh, if there is one but i'm sorry i just put it here so a motivational quotient rather than the end goal of looking at an iq or academic grade see whether we could create some sort of um, yardstick to say that what is say imagine that to uh, in in a year uh, there is a vocabulary like what is the motivational quotient of your classroom if there is something like this and we are really motivated to say that yes uh, my students are pretty motivated otherwise even if my students do well i could say that that was only because of factor that somebody could buy heart really well uh, how does can i guarantee whether that that uh, learning was lasting enough will he go and implement that learning later in life i don't know so maybe we could have a you know uh, in a way uh, it i could call it a paradigm shift uh, to change from consequence into the journey let's look at whether we could build some sort of motivational quotient of the class finally last slide sir yes um so if you if you look at if you look at this uh for the action group what would what would our action group uh the 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 members of the audience who would please uh, join our group uh what fun will we have and what learning will we do uh, we would basically look at uh that we embark on a journey uh, which in which we can envision and implement uh, relevant learning approaches and understand its impact on learning itself so maybe we could try our best to see whether we could use different types of behaviors which stimulate the brain and then consequently also keep an eye on whether this has had a clear impact on the learning on the child and then maybe you could uh, judge it as from your past experiences and if we could do this maybe we'll change le learning and education uh, in in towards the right direction so this is the idea uh, thank you so much thank you ma'am over to neena miss thank you Thank you, Rohan. That was delightful. Uh, we now welcome our next change facilitator, Ms. Minaz Ajani. Ms. Ajani holds a master's degree in special education. She is the co-founder of Leap Ahead Assessment and Learning Center, Learn Studio dot online, and Sped at the rate of home, Audi Blocks, Tutor, Handwriting Without Tears, and NILD. search and teach certified specialist she has 16 plus years of overall teaching experience she trains teachers parents and students minas has developed the social skill curriculum for kangaroo kids education for grades 1 to 12 welcome ms minas all the way from canada thank you for being with us over to you thank you neena ma'am uh, am i audible yes you are thank you so my action project will be on the impact of uh, movement on special needs uh, can i have the next slide please so let's make sense of movement based learning so can you see that there are so we are born with millions of neurons which form a network of synaptic connections and as we experience movement and sensory input so you can see that at newborn 
there are sparse connections, but at age one, it increases. And at age nine months, it has increased. And as an adult, it has increased significantly. So the experience of movement and the maturation of the brain is a process in which movement and senses mutually stimulate one another. So the more a movement is repeated, the more the movement creates secure connections in the brain. And Dr. Mazda did mention about the importance of uh, movement. So can I have the next slide, please? So as you can see here from the picture, the more mature the brain is, the more mature the quality of the motor activity. Next, please. And a moving child is a learning child. So the goal of uh, brain development is to create as many connections between them as possible and it never stops. So if physical movement declines, as we see in the later age of life, then it has an impact on the synaptic connections. And the formation of these connections takes place through child's movements and sensory experience. Next slide, please. So my project is going to be about a movement-based learning program called Brain Gym. And Brain Gym is a series of simple and enjoyable movements that are used to enhance the capacity for whole brain learning. It's a system for empowering learners of any age by using movement to enable reaching one's optimal potential. And the physical movements enable children and adults to become alert, focused, and ready to learn. So now, where does Brain Gym come from? So it was developed by Dr. Paul E. Dennison. He had uh, in the US, he's based in US. He had several and severe learning difficulties as he was growing up. And he was also one of the pioneers in the field of neurological research. He used over 50 years of research that demonstrated the effects of movement on learning. And his books, his manuals, brain gym manuals have been translated into 40 languages and are used in over 80 countries worldwide. So about the program that I will be conducting as the action group project, this program is, next slide please. This, uh, this program will be very functional and very practical. This is for adults who uh, deal with, so it, movement is important for everyone from uh, preschool to senior citizens, as well as special needs. So this will be for adults and uh, for parents, for those who are caregivers of special needs. Uh, this is an effective and efficient tool that I, we will be looking at that will enhance what you are already doing. And the important thing is that there's no special equipment that is required for this training. This will aid parents to be present and notice what their children need. Next slide, please. This, if you sign up for this action group project, you can expect the possible, these possible outcomes. There'll be improvement in sensory motor coordination, balance, as well as academic skills. So let's now do a quick recap of all the four action projects that we are going to be doing. So the first one is storytelling and its impact on language fitness by Udayan. Second is the impact of education on the cognitive development of children by Pramila. Third is creating neuroscience-based learning environments by Rohan. And the fourth one is impact of movement on special needs by me. So I hope you all jo uh, join in and encourage parents and adults to join in for all of these programs. Thank you, Nina, ma'am. Over to you, Nina, ma'am. Thank you very much. All four change facilitators we have quite a few questions here and let's see how much time we have for them.
Could we turn off the slide, please? Thank you. The first question I have is that when you talk about action projects, is there any way to make the results quantifiable? How can we be sure that storytelling, movement, art, etc., are going to actually result in change? Anyone can take that question. Should I should I go ahead? Anybody? Yes. So so basically, um, that would also depend on uh, what we would want to see the change on. So otherwise, it will just again go back to at the end of all this, does it improve academic grades? That shouldn't be the case. So if we, if as as the action group together decides uh, if if it is right to see a particular well validated uh, you know scale or a tool of assessment for motivation, happiness, emotional intelligence, uh, that we could further research and look at a yardstick of doing a pre and post assessment. So which will not only be based on academic grades, but also that could be one a yardstick later. So maybe something like that could be a thought of. Uh, that is my opinion. Uh, rest, I leave it to the other facilitators. Akshay, do you have anything to add? Donna, we can move to the second question. Okay. Yeah, there's a long one. Language and speech is well coded into the brain and is quite well understood by mere exposure to speech and language. A child is able to, an infant is able to speak. But what about reading and writing? Is there anything in neuroscience to reflect in teaching pedagogy of reading and writing? And writing, yes. Dr. Mazda, are you taking that question? Yes. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. I, I know it was long. I couldn't hear it because it kept breaking through in between. Uh, okay. Could you repeat it? Yes. See, language and speech is well, well understood by children by just mere exposure to it. But is there anything in neuroscience that will help reading and cultivate reading and writing skills? So um, I think initially, the only thing that helps cultivate reading skills is being read to. Uh, and that has to be done consistently. And that has to be done in engaging and engrossing manners rather than uh, just reading uh, in boring uh, rote fashion. So, uh, and you can even uh, read to them animatedly. You can read to them using various tools. Uh, and once their attention is engrossed, uh, they will then pick to uh, reading. So now I, 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 when I read to my children, while I started off reading, uh, uh, their regular uh, uh, stories that, uh, you know, Cinderella and the whole Disney works, etc. Now I read to them uh, uh, medical stories and they really, they're, they're four and six and they really want to know what's happening next. And uh, because that happens, they even sit and open up some books and pretend to read even though they can't read. So, you know, they will make up their own story, but they'll flip the page pretending to read. So I think being read to and being read to diversely, uh, I'm biased towards what I do and my knowledge is in that. So, but being read to consistently and diversely is the key in them uh, uh, yes. wanting to take up uh, reading and writing, I think. I mean, I'm not an expert, but this is just my Please guess. add on to this. Can I, am I audible? Yes. Of course, of course. Yeah. Also, um, also, what what we read to the children at a particular age also matters. Um, like um, like Doctor uh, had uh, you know uh, mentioned in the beginning that at a particular age they are not able to uh, understand what is sharing or what is you know about uh, uh, not being materialistic. So similarly, if we pick up age specific 
content to read like a story which you know initially when we uh, read out stories to uh, kids at a very young age um, no normally we, uh, it it's not required to attach a moral to it because they would not understand at that age children should just pick it up and you know make um, you know they they have to conclude it themselves only after a particular age would you know moral of a story make any impact on them so age uh, uh, you know it should be age specific what you are reading to a particular child and and then eventually it will develop uh, the skill you know uh, one about the other and enhance it thank you and these days we virtually have an infinite variety available to us of stories and mark who is here today will surely endorse that that we did when we were growing up we did not have these kind of stories the kind of diverse stories from different cultures etc so the more we read to them the better and the more diverse the reading the better um there is one question here and that is that does the size of the brain really matter it was once believed that white males of the caucasian race have larger and therefore better brains than women and all people of color how true is that i mean i don't think there's a uh... the uh, any real uh, scientific consistent scientific evidence that shows that si- the size matters it's really uh, like with everything else what you do with it some people uh, uh, hypothesize that einstein's brain was larger than the general population i think it's more to do with the connections that you build over time and the integrity of the synapses because really what happens is that there's this concept called as dendritic pruning so what is really not required gets pruned off and what you use more and more of uh, gets uh, reinforced so i have done a little bit of reading and in that i have not found size to be an independent uh, determinant of uh, cognitive abilities or enhanced uh, performance or a measure of success in any in any form thank you <clears throat> okay how can we use our understanding of neuroscience to build resilience in children i mean i think that comes with uh, with uh, developing their emotional uh, core um to probably it will also come through storytelling but it will also come through personal experiences uh, at a young age giving them the independence to do the things that they might seem uh, too young to do uh, exposing them to a certain kind of hardships which we as parents think that they might not be ready for some of those things might uh, build resilience again it's a very individual istic uh, approach and i'm sure our generation like my parents generation uh was may way more resilient than our generation mm. similarly i don't think our children are are half as resilient as us unfortunately uh and i think it's got to do with your personal experiences uh that define it but we need to we need to i mean it's an excellent question i think we need to find ways in which to make the current younger generation resilient because uh this is a generation that is uh, looking at instant gratification for everything uh everybody wants to be rich and successful by the time they are 20 and uh usually they say that overnight success takes about 20 years so i mean it, this is something that we really need to look into i don't have answers to be honest off the cuff but uh building resilience in in children not accepting uh being able to deal with failure is a big problem in today's generation um and we need to we need to find ways to to be able to address this issue
Rohan, Rohan spoke about motivational quotient. I'm wondering if motivational quotient could change to inspirational quotient. Because if we talk of motivation, then the stimulus always has to come from outside. But if you can inspire and uh, whet a child's curiosity, maybe we could reconsider this MQ, make it IQ in a very different way, inspirational quotient. So um, I think right now, uh, on, as my opinion, I, I would just want to state that um, any type of vocabulary that we use eventually should not be you know, reduced to just that vocabulary. Basically, then at the end, what do you do? Has, has it had an impact on the child? Uh, so I could debate it in such a way that not all motivation is extrinsic. You know, there will always be some intrinsic motivation. Uh, so from the brain aspect, it's as simple as nobody needs to tell you to go drink water once every, you know, whenever you're thirsty. That's intrinsic motivation. So neurologically, when you talk about motivation, it goes to, you know, your ventromedial hypothalamus and all these places, which Osmo receptors, they already tell you that, and that's that's how they, they measure uh, hunger and thirst motivation. So imagine you could create, that's the, that's the connotation of motivation that I was trying to use, but eventually, yes, happiness quotient, uh, inspirational quotient, inspiration quotient, emotional quotient. Uh, I just hope that we are not getting fixated by making a term that sounds you know, very nice just as a, a counter to IQ. No, we will not take IQ. Either way, eventually, we have to see to it that the kids are happy to learn and the learning is uh, it's ap applied to their lives to make them better people and the learning is lasting. So it's not a superficial learning. So either you want to inspire them or motivate them, do whatever, but uh, we need to get them uh, you know, to learn in a better way. So yes, it could be inspirational learning. We'll look into this. Let's discuss. More discussions need to happen. Uh, while we are chatting, one more question has come up, and that is that uh, I think part of it has been answered by Mazda, but uh, should we be introducing children to spirituality at a young age? I think absolutely. Uh, this practice of mindfulness is very important. Uh, it can be incorporated by children watching their parents do it at home, which is the most natural way to incorporate something. Children learn a lot by osmosis. But uh, I think we have more and more um, evidence to show that spirituality, mindfulness, doing a routine or doing a practice for 5, 10, 15 minutes a day um, allows you to, to go through that rest of the day with, uh, you know, it's like in some sense building some sort of armor to deal with the world when you get out in the morning. So... I think it's extremely essential. And now we have, we have evidence to show that it really helps. So uh, schools, uh, educators, parents should all think about incorporating this realm in, in their uh, standard of, of education. I, I think it's, it forms a very, very crucial, I'm guessing above the age of seven-ish should be around the right time when they uh, would be able to absorb a lot of it. Okay, um, a question from Minas. Minas, you uh, is Minas there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Minas, you spoke about movement. So, are we not damaging our students by restricting them in classrooms, and now more so with the online education? We are in a way. So that is why movement is the most important uh, thing now, especially more now than ever before. And uh, yeah, so these are the move, the movements that I will be showing are the ones that can be easily done in the classroom. Yes. So that is why it's important. So thank you, Minas. Thank you, everyone. And now we have Mr. Milan Soman, who is going to conduct the valedictory session. We pass on the baton back to you, Nina, to introduce Mr. Soman. Thank you all very much. Thank you, ma'am. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Mr. Milan Soman. Mr. Milan Soman helps people unlock their potential at life and work by helping them leverage their strengths. 
He is a Gallup certified strength coach, helping individuals and organizations get better at what they do best. He's an expert in the software development industry and since 2008 has been focusing on the organizational transformation of various types of businesses aimed at delivering innovative solutions and products valued by customers. He has worked with startups, small and medium-sized product companies and big enterprises, helping the organizations adopt an agile mindset. As a strengths coach, he specializes in organizational change on a systemic and holistic level, advising the organization on the best approach to evolve their way of working to meet their business needs and fit their unique context. As a person, he strongly believes in cross-disciplinary and diverse collaboration as a key to dealing with the ever-growing complexity of modern problems. He emphasizes servant leadership and facilitation, sorry, as his main tool to enable individuals and teams to reach their potential. He's interested in human psychology and behavior to understand how we can build sustainable solutions for the future. He has immense experience working with multicultural teams and understanding ways of tackling the challenges that come with distributed setups. He's in constant search for innovative methods of collaboration and since 2016 has been coaching people through a structured program and helping them to get better outcomes in their relationships, whether personal, with peers, bosses, organizations, and subordinates. He believes in the principles of positive psychology and finds the Gallup strengths approach very appealing. A keen golfer, his passion is to help people become the best version of themselves. A very warm welcome to you once again, Mr. Soman, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. What a wonderful session it has been. Uh, Dr. Mazda's session opened up my mind, and I'm sure it has opened up everybody's mind. So uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to share with you some of my thoughts and uh, see you know what is it that uh, we need to do for the road ahead is my screen visible to everybody yes yes milan so thank you so the vision of this uh, this gtps for for change, the Education Summit has been a fascinating four weeks of uh, lectures and erudite scholars talking about various subjects. Been very interesting and very aligned to the vision, which is to create healthy and nurturing ecosystem by combining knowledge with self-awareness and wisdom and transform our scarcity consciousness to one of abundance. Fantastic. It's so well aligned and I really enjoyed every session that I've heard. The objective is basically to achieve some of these 17 sustainable developmental goals created by the United Nations before 2030 and unlock the potential. What did this summit do for us? The education system transformation the intention of the summit is to transform the education system to a learning ecosystem. This reminds me of my uh, brainstorming session I had in one of the global uh, management schools about seven years back when we were trying to change the pedagogy for a shift from teaching to learning. And over the years, the it has given us in the, the Institute incredible results. And today the Institute has gone up in its global ranking. So we know for sure that the outcomes from this change is positive and sustainable. This four weeks we have seen erudite and learned speakers speak on various subjects. and identify about 30 odd action projects from 
basic rights and equality through education to leveraging, leveraging interdisciplinary modeling experience and to neurosciences, which we heard Dr. Mazda today. For change, education is at the epicenter of change. And we talk about people right from their kindergarten, from birth to a continuous education program, even for professional. So education doesn't end, frankly. Dr. Mazda today opened up our minds to say, you know, use your left and right and get it right. And that's what we are going to look going ahead. So I urge everybody, all participants to be a part of this global movement together for a better world. The intention or the objective of these action projects, as the word action state, is not only to draft thoughts and theories on paper, but get and identify actionable outcomes which can be implemented. It is really an attempt to walk the talk. What a wonderful uh, spiritual guidance we received right in the beginning to say improving education system so young generations can become more responsible global citizen. All these eight speakers have really aligned the subject matters in this direction. This is an uh, era of uh, collaboration and sharing. So take a few minutes on the current pandemic we are going through, COVID. Dr. Masa very aptly put that what we did not know, what we knew about our brain in 100 years, we have learned it in the last five years and probably we'll know much more in the next one year. That's exactly what has happened even in the development of the vaccine. Vaccines have never been developed so fast. COVID provided us a challenge and an opportunity and the technology and our ability to leverage these three to get outcome at a rapid pace. This really gives me the confidence to say that the work that the action groups are going to put in will come in, will come out fast and be implementable quickly. The era is about interdisciplinary and cross-functional approach to projects and activities. And I would urge teams to be in a mode of sharing and collaboration so that together we achieve more. Let us be participative and work as a team with interdependence and collaborativeness. This is going to be the hallmark of our next steps and the way we'll work. When one talks of change, it means many things. Change doesn't happen just by thought. It's only thought is only a part of the change. There is ideation. There is a need to conceptualize the change. There is a need to implement the change. There is a need to measure the change, make modifications, craft it, improve it, put it back into the environment and community, measure it again. So it is a continuous cycle of measurement and improvement. One of the key attributes of the change is to continuously feel the pulse of the audience impacted by change. This must be factored in all the activities that we are going to do as a part of our action groups. As with anything, as, a, as my expertise is, I always tend to focus on putting a process in place. Why? Because process ensures consistency, actionability, as well as quality. A standard change process will start from adding an, as, identifying an as-is status, so mapping the current status, 
what do i intend how do i see my future that is a to be scenario and what is going to be my journey from an as is to a to be and how do we constitute this journey to be a continuous improvement process what are the methodologies we want to use or craft what are the milestones we intend to achieve our objectives i would urge all change action groups to focus some time on this there is a very nice methodology we have which is really the pdcs cycle what is this this is an iterative four stage problem solving model used globally for carrying out a sustained change change simply put in it is plan planning recognizing an opportunity and planning the change what we spoke about to map identify the as is and the to be and how to really move from an as is to to be actually start doing it mapping the journey implementing the journey testing the journey doing some pilots getting feedback flowing the feedback back into the methodology to uh, create a more robust methodology and finally start implementing it into large scale communities the whole intention of this change initiative by gtps is really to get actionable steps in a time bound manner what do, what can i bring to the table i have had over 30 years of experience in business consulting and technology consulting we really understand and bring to this practice we can bring to this practice a structured processes and managing complex project with interdisciplinary and cross functional teams this is the, exactly the requirements of this set of 32 action groups this is a science and it needs training it needs exposure and then there can be a multiplier effect to the outcome if we apply it project management effective project management is really at the crux of successful implementation if you look at some of the the singapore is a country where every bus or a train will come at the particular station at the time it is meant to come it is programmed and that is the only country in the last decade or in the last many decade which has really transitioned from a developing country to a developed economy in the last 40 years and it has been hard work and very robust project planning and implementation any planning we need i planning ideation creativity identifying dependencies what are the tasks we can delegate whom can we take in as partners how can we collaborate be in a collaborative state what is going to be my plan b how do i measure it how do i monitor it how do i flow it back at the learnings and you know improve on my existing system and then effectively use measurement to manage my project we had some of these questions today which i heard about how do we measure the outcome it will be interesting to see how action groups come up with certain criteria for measurement of uh, outcome so we are going to be looking at you know applying some of these learning and experiences from technology business to gtps to see the light at the end of these action groups these action groups are led by passionate change facilitators and a set of engaged and passionate action group members i would urge people to sign up to different action groups in the coming week 
so that we can have a robust set of people being a part of the change to see the change. In the week of the, we are going to have a, we are planning to have a workshop for members of the action group and the change facilitators to expose them to tools, techniques, and methodology in the area of effective project management, creativity, and problem solving. It's going to be a two and a half hour session in the week of, it will be scheduled in the week of December 21. And I would urge everybody to participate in that as we will have some hands-on hands experiences and exposures to this. I look forward to seeing the outcomes from these action groups get implemented and seeing the change in this rapid uh, time frame that we have for ourselves. Thank you and wish the teams all the very best. Over to you, Nina. Thank you very much, Milin. Just as we have so much to learn from neuroscience, we have so much to learn from management. Thank you for tying up all the loose ends so beautifully. And a big thank you for offering a workshop to all our change facilitators. Welcome. We will get the notices to our change facilitators. Yeah. It will be entirely yeah. voluntary. If you want to hop in and learn more about project management, here is a chance. So thank you very much, Milin. And over to you, Nina. Thank you, ma'am. I now invite Ms. Valerie Mendoza, Senior Associate Research at CIIE, co-housed in I am Ahmedabad, to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Thank you. not unmute yeah sorry uh yeah i was on mute uh, just allow me to share my screen here okay uh could you please enable me to screen share thank you Thank you, Dr. Turel, for leading neuroeducation. Many thanks also to the dynamic team of change facilitators comprising Udayan Chakrabarti, Pramila Satish, Menaz Ajani, and Rohan Pillai. We are aware of your commitment to the summit and the regular meetings you've had despite your busy schedules. We also thank you for putting together a very meaningful action project, a nodding, a nodding acquaintance with the development of a child's brain. A sincere gratitude to Mr. Milin Soman for encouraging our team of change facilitators and pointing the way forward with total clarity. Our thanks go out to all the participants who have joined us from India and different countries of the world. Do register for the Parenting Summit from the 8th to the 31st of January 2021. As you know, the sessions are scheduled during the weekends for your convenience. We need you to work collaboratively with us to bring about the change we want to see in the world. Please note the last date for signing up on action groups will be next Sunday, the 20th of December, 2020. Do not miss this opportunity and do register on our website, www.gtpsforchange.org. We hope to see you on Friday, 8th Jan, for the inaugural session from 4 to 5.50 p.m. for our parenting summit. Since we are working towards the highest good of every learner, we intend to initiate a dialogue between parents and educators by seeing educators at the Parenting Summit, just as we have had parents at this summit on education. Do follow us on our social media. We tweet at GTPS4C. Until next time, stay happy, stay safe.